if you are using the unit of work pattern with CQRS, you're going to end up with a lot of duplicate code in your command handlers. How do we usually solve code duplication? We do that by creating an abstraction. So in this video, I'm going to create an abstraction with the unit of work and mediators pipeline behavior. Let's first take a look at the create order command handler. You'll see that it's depending on a few repository interfaces. And then we have the unit of work abstraction. If we take a look at the handle method, you'll see that the repositories are used to fetch the data from the database, insert new entities into the repository, and then we use the unit of work to persist the changes. If I go to the remove line item command handler, which is injecting the order repository and the unit of work again, you'll see the same pattern repeated. So we fetch something from the repository, we do some business operation, and we call save changes async. If I take a look at the few command handlers for the product, let's say create product command handler, you'll see the same pattern again. We do something with the repository, we call save changes. Let's take a look at the update product command handler. We fetch something from the database, perform some update, and we call save changes async. And the same applies in the delete product command handler. We fetch the product, delete it using the repository, and again, we call save changes async. So the general pattern is perform some sort of business operation and call the unit of work to persist this in the database. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could get rid of this call to the unit of work and move it someplace else so that it's always called and we don't need to think about it in our command handlers. Well, it turns out we can do that because we are using Mediator and we're going to see how to create a pipeline behavior implementation that's going to wrap the current request in a unit of work transaction. Let's start by creating a folder which is going to hold our behaviors. And I'm going to define a new class inside which is going to be my generic pipeline behavior. I'm going to call it unit of work behavior. I'm going to make this class public and sealed. And we have to implement the iPipeline behavior interface, which is coming from Mediator. This is a generic interface with two generic arguments, the request type and the response type. So let's add those to our unit of work behavior, the request and the response and we're going to pass them to the iPipeline behavior interface. And what's missing is the generic constraint for the T request that it must not be null. So let's go ahead and implement our interface and you'll see that there is one handle method and the delegate for the request handler that we are about to invoke. Before I implement the unit the work behavior, let's register this class with dependency injection. I already have a call to add mediator here, which is registering my request handlers, which are my command and query handlers. And to register the pipeline behavior, we need to call the add open behavior method, which is going to allow us to register our generic behavior. We're going to specify our type by calling type of and specifying the unit of work behavior class. So this takes care of registering this behavior. The slight problem with this approach is that this is a wrapper around any kind of mediator request. And this is going to cover both our commands and our queries. Because I only want to run this behavior on my commands, I'm going to add a filter at the start that is going to check if the current request is a command you could introduce some sort of marker interface that is going to check if this request object is a command, like an I command interface, or you could rely on your naming convention. My naming convention assumes that all of my commands are going to have their name ending with command. So I can say something like this, type of the request. I can take the name of the type now and I can check that it ends with the word command. And this is enough to verify that the current request is a command or it is not. 
So let's say if this is not a command, I'm just going to call the next request handler delegate by calling await next. This is going to continue my pipeline. Otherwise, let's take care of our command handler and the unit of work behavior. So obviously we need to start by injecting our unit of work. So let's go ahead and do that. So unit of work and we inject it from the constructor. And right here, what we want to do is we want to simply invoke our command handler and we want to say unit of work, save changes async and we pass it the cancellation token. Now, because we need to return some sort of result, we can store the result of this call into a variable. So whatever is the response. And after we have called unit of work, save changes async, we can return this response. To make this a little bit more readable, we can move this check into some sort of method, which we can call either is query, or we can call it is not command. So whatever works for you. If this is not a command, just await the request handler delegate and return. Otherwise, we await it and store the result. We call our unit of work and persist the changes, and only then do we return our response. What does this mean for our command handlers? Let's take a look at them one by one, and we can start removing this call to unit of work, save changes async. This also means that we can drop the dependency on the unit of work interface from our class and from our constructor. So this is what we are left with. Let's do this also in the remaining command handlers. So I'm going to be a little bit quicker now with removing these. Next up is the create product command handler. So let's get rid of this. And we can also make this not asynchronous. But if we do that, we need to return some sort of task. So we can say return task completed task, or you can leave it asynchronous, but there's really no point if you won't be awaiting anything inside. Let's go to the create order command handler, get rid of the call to save changes async, and remove our dependency on the unit of work. And the only thing that's remaining is the remove line item command handler. Let's get rid of the unit of work call here and the dependency in our class. So what we are left with is just this. We are using the order repository, fetching the order from the database, removing the line item, and we are relying on our unit of work behavior to persist these changes. The potential problem with this approach is that persisting to the database is implicit and you have to be aware of what's going on behind the scenes but it's going to spare you writing those calls to save changes async, we have to note that this only works because we are using EF core. And EF core has a change tracker, which is tracking all of the changes that are made in a single transaction. If we take a look at this example, we are adding an order and an order summary in the same request. And EF core will take care of persisting these in a single transaction to the database. So we won't run into the situation where one of these is persisted and the other one is not. We have an atomic transaction because we are using a SQL database. Another issue that you could run into is having to return some sort of result from your command handler. A common situation is returning an ID of the newly created entity. In this example, that would be the order ID in my implementation, the order ID is already generated at the domain level because I'm using a GUID value, which I can create in memory. But if you are relying on database generated values, then you have a problem. There are two ways how you can solve this. I'm going to show you both of them, and then you can decide if any of these are worth your time. One is to use the high-low strategy for generating your primary keys. So let's say if you were using some sort of numeric value as the primary key, like a long or an integer, you can go to your application DB context and inside of the onModelCreating method, you can configure EF core to use the high-low strategy 
for generating your primary keys. What this is going to do is EF Core is going to fetch a set of values for the primary key and EF Core is going to store them in memory and use them when you add new entities. Whenever a batch of keys is used, EF will fetch another batch. And if your application stops and restarts, then the current batch is lost and EF is going to just fetch another one. If this is not something you want to do, then you are left with no choice but having to use the unit of work here. So what that would look like is, let's just bring back the unit of work that we had before. So we are back where we started. And after you call unit of work save changes, only then you can say something like return order ID. So this is in the case where you are not using a primary key, which you can generate in memory. The downside to this approach is you have one call to save changes here. It's quite possible that you could introduce some other logic here and then rely on your call to save changes in the unit of work behavior. And this is a big problem because this is not going to be one transaction, but two of them. Either one of them could fail. If the first one here fails, then you're good. Nothing is going to be wrong. But if this one succeeds, and then the unit of work behavior call fails, then you're going to end up in an inconsistent state. So the solution is just to create a transaction at the unit of work behavior level. To create a transaction, you either need to expose something on the unit of work. Another option how you can achieve this is by creating a transaction scope. So let's go ahead and use that approach. I'm going to create a new transaction scope instance. Of course, I misspelled the name, so let's rename this to transaction scope. And then we need to move our code inside of the using statement. Now, it's very important after we call save changes async that we also call transaction scope complete. This is going to create a global transaction and your EF core queries are going to run inside. Then you can go ahead and invoke your request handler. And if you have calls to the save changes method inside, they are going to be running inside of a transaction that is the same one that this call in our unit of work behavior is running in. After we have completed everything, we call transaction scope complete. And this tells the transaction scope that we are done with our changes and we can commit this transaction to the database. What happens if something goes wrong? This is why it's so important to define the transaction scope inside of a using statement. And when the using statement goes out of bounds, the transaction scope will be disposed. And if there are any exceptions, the transaction scope will roll back, making sure that we have an atomic transaction. I'm curious to hear what you think about using this approach with the unit of work behavior. So let me know in the comments down below. Also, make sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons. And until next time, stay awesome.